all of us living in the United States uh, have encountered a lot, and that is uh, self-congratulation. Uh, that we are a fund in the United States of congratulating ourselves for how wonderful we are and uh, how we are the best, we are the greatest, we are the strongest, we are the most prosperous, uh, we are the freest, uh, we are the most democratic. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, uh, we are number one. And we are, in fact, number one in many things. And we are very good, really very good in many things. And those are the things I probably don't have to tell you about because uh, anybody who is in the United States, anybody, even for a short time, you know, knows because the things that, that the United States is good about are immediately apparent. Uh, but th that's not enough. Uh, that doesn't tell the whole story. And if, if we only dwell on what we all acknowledge are some of the remarkable things about the United States, we will be missing something very important, something in fact so important that uh, we'll be shocked if something happens one day that uh, arouses us uh, from our complacency and that makes us wonder how it is that a country so s gifted, so special, so superior should experience suddenly a disaster that nobody can explain. You know, and well, yes, when 9-11 happened, uh, that was an occasion perhaps for reflection on ourselves, a sober and critical reflection on ourselves. That did not happen in the higher reaches of government. Uh, the, the people at the top of the government are not given to self-reflection or to self-criticism. Uh, no, instead, you know, the reaction was a, a kind of a hysterical reaction, a, a, a reaching out. <laughs> well, reaching is, is a euphemism. Uh, war, violence, attack, uh, do something, uh, but no, no reflection. Uh, so I think that that kind of examination of who we are as a country is needed so we won't be unguarded, so we won't be shocked when something terrible happens, uh, so we will perhaps begin to understand. Um, I mean, this uh, idea of self-congratulation sometimes uh, manifests itself this way, that, that if you criticize the United States government, uh, and a lot of people here probably experience this, as anybody who has ever uttered a word of criticism, uh, and you're met with the uh, exhortation, um, well, why don't you go somewhere else? <laughs> well, why, why, well, sometimes they say, why don't you go back to where you came from, you know, which might be Brooklyn, you see. But, but it's, it's you know, some, but somehow go somewhere else. Now, a friend of mine who is a, a comedian, I mean, I have friends of mine who are comedians but who don't know it. But this is a, a guy who is a comedian and who knows it. Uh, but he's also serious. Um, some of you have maybe have encountered him because he used to do comedy here in the Boston area. His name is Barry Crimmins. And, 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 when, and he, in his serious comedy, he would very often be critical of certain things uh, that the United States had done in the world. You know, and, and people would say to him, well, why don't you move somewhere else? And he would say, I don't want to move somewhere else because I don't want to become the victim of American foreign policy, you see. Uh, well, this, this notion of uh, uh, superiority and exceptionalism starts early. Um, and uh, Sarah Merton, who wrote this book, points out that it starts as early as, well, here in 
the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630. The colony had just begun, and, and the governor, uh, Winthrop, uh, utters those words, which uh, centuries later will be repeated uh, by Ronald Reagan, who is a great student, as you know, of early American history. And uh, the Winthrop uh, talked about uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, as uh, a city on a hill. Uh, I think Reagan embellished it a little and talked about a golden city on a hill. Well, the idea of a city on a hill, and you've probably heard that expression a number of times, the idea of a city on a hill uh, is, a, is a nice one because it suggests a, a model. It suggests setting an example. It uh, actually it's, it suggests what, in fact, uh, George Bush has spoken of, and he said, you know, we, uh, we are a beacon of, of liberty and democracy, and if, if, if that was what we were, if that's all we are, if that's, we're a city on a hill that people can look to and people can learn from and people can admire and people can emulate, I mean, that is a wonderful thing to be. But it doesn't stop there with just being a city on a hill. Uh, in fact, you can see it because of just a few years after uh, Governor Winthrop utters these words about being a city on a hill, just a few years later, the people in the city on a hill move out to massacre the Peacock Indians who seem to think they belong on the, this land. And uh, there's a description of that uh, which was uh, William Bradford, one of the early uh, settlers in Massachusetts at that time, a, a contemporary of Winthrop, wrote a history of the Plymouth Plantation, and, and he talks about how you know, the Captain Mason uh, attacking a Peacock village uh, said, you know, oh, we must uh, burn them. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, Bradford reports, those that escaped the fire were slain with a sword, some hewed to pieces, some uh, run through with their rapiers so as they were quickly dispatched and very few escaped. It is conceived that the thus destroyed about 400 at this time. It was a fearful sight to see them frying in the fire and the streams of blood quenching the same. Uh, but the victory seemed a sweet sacrifice and they gave prayers thereof to God who had wrought so wonderfully for them and given them so speedy a victory over so proud and insulting an enemy. And uh, very early on, there's an association uh, between what the government does and what God approves of. Uh, and uh, in that process of not being just a city on a hill, but of moving out, of expanding, uh, continued. Uh, that's a, a persistent fact of American history, going all the way back to those first settlers and coming down to the present day. The persistence of expansion into somebody else's territory uh, and occupying that territory and dealing harshly with, with the people you know, who resist that occupation. And uh, you know, one of the things that when you study the American Revolution School, one of the things they don't tell you, uh, 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 well, you know, we know about the good things of the American Revolution, independence from England and the Declaration of Independence and all of that, but generally they, they skip over the fact that independence from England uh, for the colonists uh, was disastrous for the Indians because it meant that from now on uh, the colonists who had been restrained by the British in their proclamation of 1763 setting a, a line, a boundary uh, within which the settlers were supposed to stay so as not to encroach into Indian territory, this uh, boundary line was now uh, erased and now the 
colonists. Now with the revolution victorious with independence from England, the colonists could move westward you know, into Indian territory. And of course that process you know, continued on and on with the, the kind of description that you heard of the Peacock Massacre occurring again and again in, in American history as we moved across uh, to the west coast and down uh, you know, to the Gulf of Mexico. And this notion of God being involved, this notion of being uh, sort of divinely ordained, you know, that, that notion continued. In the middle of the 19th century, uh, on the eve of the war with Mexico, when the United States had just annexed Texas, a lot of Americans don't know that Texas was just part of Mexico. Uh, a lot, lot of people in the United States don't know that California was once part of Mexico. They wonder, why do they have all these Spanish names out there? San this and Santa this and Sa Yeah, well. Uh, but on the eve of a war with Mexico, uh, the, this uh, famous phrase was coined by a, a, a writer and editor named uh, John O'Sullivan. He, he spoke about uh, manifest destiny. And uh, he, he said it was our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. Providence, God, continue to be involved in, in expansion. When, when the United States went into the Philippines uh, at, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, President McKinley, uh, so some of you may know this because it's uh, not everything that I say to people is an obscure fact, and sometimes I tell people that they really know. Maybe often I tell people things that they really know. Sometimes I think everything I tell people is something they really know, but I say it anyway. And, uh, but you may have heard that McKinley said that he, the decision to invade the Philippines uh, came uh, you know, one night, you know, uh, when he prayed and God uh, told him to take the Philippines. Uh, and so uh, this is a very dangerous kind of idea. <laughs> once, once you have God's permission to do what you want, you, you, you need no uh, criterion of, of human morality. Uh, and, and with President Bush, uh, if you don't mind me skipping immediately uh, a lot of American history uh, to uh, President Bush, uh, it, I mean, it's well known that Bush has a special relationship to God uh, and, and that Bush invokes God every chance he gets. He's not the only president. I, you know, I mustn't be too hard. He's not the only president who does this. The invoking God is a very common thing all th you know, through American history. But Bush ha has made a, a specialty of it. And uh, he, now I'm gonna tell you something where I, I don't know if this is true. Not all historians will admit that the things they tell you may not be true. But it sounds true to me. <laughs> How's that for a scientific uh, bit of evidence? Uh, and that is uh, an article appeared in the, in the Israeli newspaper, Haaretz. Any of you remember an article that appeared in the Israeli newspaper, Haaretz? in which the reporter talks about talking to Palestinian leaders who had met with Bush. Okay, finally I'm telling you something that is not only fairly new, but dubious. <laughs> but, uh, but according to this reporter, he spoke to this Palestinian leader, and the Palestinian leader reported on his conversation with Bush, and as he reported, Bush told him, God told me to strike at Al-Qaeda, and I struck them. And then he instructed me to strike at Saddam, which I did. And now I am determined to solve the problem in the Middle East. 
Well, as I say, who knows? <laughs> you know, it's one of those situations where you get something second and third hand. It's just that it's plausible, knowing Bush. It's, uh, whether it's true or not, <laughs> it's plausible. It fits everything else. This, this, uh, this, now I'll give you a piece of evidence, which is, um, I think, m more credible. Uh, that is, it's, it's closer to home. Here's, because here's the, this is the president of the um, Ethics and Religious Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, a friend of Bush, and says that Bush told him during the election campaign, quote, I believe God wants me to be president. Now, I, I would consider that interference in a free election. Uh, I mean, and God wants me to be president. Now, this actually was reported in the newspaper, and and uh, and the uh, and and this man, uh, Richard Lamb, who uh, says that Bush told him this during the election campaign, uh, he resented the fact that it was quoted. I believe God wants me to be president, but it was quoted out of context. Context was that Bush followed this up by saying, but if that doesn't happen, it's OK. Well, I, I thought, yeah, that's reasonable. Uh, he's you know, willing, willing to change his mind if God changes his or her mind. OK. Um, this, this idea of God uh, giving uh, strength to whatever the government does uh, you know, is something that is true, you know, not just with Bush, but at the, the higher reaches of American government, uh, the people around Bush, uh, and, uh, and Justice Scalia. Uh, Justice Scalia, I don't know how closely you watch him, uh, but... Um, Oh, this is an aside, because I just got this in the mail today, and that was uh, something, a uh, publication uh, of the Dramatists Guild, in which they have a, uh, a, they re reproduce a talk that the playwright Tony Kushner gave at Bard College, and it's all about Scalia. Uh, but that's just uh, an aside. Scalia uh, seriously believes that God is the source of governmental power. And he has said this again and again. And uh, he's, uh, uh, he spoke in, uh, well, two years ago at the Un University of Chicago Divinity School, he said, government is the minister of God. Uh, government derives its moral authority from God. And uh, I mean, this is a, a dangerous idea in anybody's hands. Uh, Scalia seems to be overlooking the fact that the Declaration of Independence suggests that government gets its power, <coughs> his authority, <coughs> excuse me, from the people. I mean, that's what the, the government gets its authority from the people. It's answerable to the people. If the government uh, doesn't uh, make sure that people have an equal right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, it is then the people who have the right uh, to, as the Declaration of Independence says, to alter or abolish the government. Uh, but, uh, but I suppose Scalia is a strict constitutionalist, and the Declaration of Independence is not part of the Constitution. In fact, the Declaration of Independence is not a legal document at all. It's just, uh, you know, the most idealistic statement that to come out of the American Revolution and one to be put aside as soon as you win the revolution. Uh, so this idea of, of, of God being the source of governmental power, I mean, it's always dangerous in anybody's hands. I mean, it's dangerous when people call themselves the chosen people.
it's dangerous there too. Uh, but if these people don't have a lot of power, there's not much they can do with that. They can sort of enjoy the fact that they are the chosen people. Uh, if there's some point in history where they develop the power to do something to somebody else, uh, well, then, then it becomes serious. And we've seen then there are uh, people who, uh, in Israel who have uh, uh, who justify the, uh, the occupation of the West Bank on sort of very pragmatic grounds of security and self-defense, but there are others, uh, 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 there are religious fanatics who justify the occupation on the basis of, uh, yes, being the chosen people and being uh, chosen by God uh, to do this. Uh, of course, there are, there are there are important people, important Jews, who have uh, opposed this idea of calling themselves the chosen people, uh, considering uh, what terrible things have been done in the name of, of uh, being selected by God. Um, after all, the, the, the Nazi stormtroopers had on their belts uh, Gott mit uns, God with us. Uh, so it's a dangerous concept when, especially when people who believe they are instructed by God have great military power, and the Nazis with their military power and with that kind of divine ordination, uh, we know what they di did uh, in Europe. And now you have the United States, uh, and you have a government uh, which uh, uh, assures us uh, gets its uh, uh, power from God, uh, and with the, in the hands of the United States, this is a dangerous doctrine because of, simply because of the great power of the United States uh, to do whatever they think is God's will. That is a, a nation with uh, 10,000 nuclear weapons, uh, a nation with uh, military bases in a hundred different countries with warships on every sea. Uh, when you couple that power with the notion of divine sanction, uh, then, then the world, you know, is uh, in danger. And uh, this idea, you see, uh, that uh, that the United States should use its power in the world, should revel in its being number one, at the, became especially important at the end of World War II, because at the end of World War II, the United States did become the preeminent power in the world. Yes, there was the Soviet, Soviet Union, uh, but, but it was the United States that was you know, the greatest economic and, and with the atomic weapons, the greatest military power in the world. And at the end of World War II, uh, Henry Luce, who is one of the, I guess, most important non-governmental people, one of the most powerful non-governmental people in the country, you know, the owner of a vast chain of media enterprises, the man who owned time, life and fortune. I mean, not just the magazines, but the things themselves. Uh, but Henry Luce said uh, that this, uh, this would be the American century. Uh, as he put it, uh, the victory now at the end of World War II gave the United States the right to exert upon the world the full impact of our influence for such purposes as we see fit and by such means as we see fit. And that idea uh, that we do what we want, uh, uh, that this is the American century, that in fact uh, persisted and was acted out through the rest of the 20th century. 
because the United States you know, continued to expand, even, even with the Soviet Union there and, and, and soon acquiring its own nuclear weapons, uh, the, the United States continued to expand into its influence in, uh, into the oil regions of the Middle East by this uh, special arrangement with, with Saudi Arabia. Uh, um, into uh, Asia uh, with Japan and uh, and uh, um, into certainly into Latin America uh, and you know, there were some setbacks uh, this, you know setback in in Vietnam and but the Philippines remained a, a very important base for the United States. And yes, and soon the United States had military bases all over the world, and soldiers and sailors stationed all over the world. And uh, the uh, and the Cold War with the Soviet Union did not really do much to stop this expansion. In fact, the Cold War, the existence of the Soviet Union as a rival the existence of something called a communist threat in the world uh, gave uh, the United States a, a justification for doing so much of what it was doing in the world, for expanding its power in the world, for overthrowing this government or that gov government, or moving troops here and moving troops there, and all uh, justified by the necessity of stopping communism. Now you, you can see that I think historically uh, that this was a, an artificial justification. And by that I mean that uh, that this wasn't the real reason for American expansion in the world. The real reason for American expansion was not uh, to stop communism. After all, that expansion was a continuation of expansion which had gone on for a long time. Uh, if you want to see the, uh, the limits of that idea that, that it was the Soviet Union and the Cold War which was the reason for America, the United States expanding its power in the world, all you have to do is, is ask the question, uh, what was going on before 1917? What was going on before there was a Bolshevik revolution? You mean at that point the United States was just mind minding its own business? Uh, no. Uh, long before, long before there was a Bolshevik Revolution, the United States was engaged in expanding its power into the Caribbean, uh, into the Pacific. Uh, so, uh, uh, what happened, of course, is that the Cold War ended. That justification ended. But very soon after, 9-11 uh, happened. And once 9-11 took place, uh, another justification appeared. Uh, terrorism replaced communism as a kind of simple answer to the question of, you know, why are we going here? Why are we going there? Why are we making war here? Why are we sending troops there? And you know, in, in the in the fifties, you know, why are we overthrowing the government of Guatemala, or the government of Chile, or the government of Iran? Well, it's communism, uh, and now uh, and now it's terrorism, and it has a certain plausibility because there was a reality to communism. Uh, but what we did in relation to that reality went far beyond uh, what the real threat was. There's a reality to terrorism, but what we do in relation to terrorism uh, does not quite meet the requirement of uh, having an effect, serious effect on terrorism. And it does suggest uh, that there uh, are motives uh, deeper uh, than the idea of fighting terrorism for the American move uh, into the Middle East in these past few years. So uh, <clears throat> one year after 9-11, after 
uh, uh, President Bush announces, you know, the national security strategy. Um, and this basically lays out the principles for American foreign policy uh, and uh, lays out the principles of uh, uh, unilateralism, uh, 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 the, and the preemption, uh, and uh, making sure that uh, no power can rival the power of the United States in the world. Uh, and uh, essentially, this is a declaration that the United States could ignore the UN Charter, because if you, if you, if you accept preemption, uh, then you are violating the principle of the UN Charter that you're only uh, supposed to make war in, in self-defense. Uh, and, uh, and I suggest to you also violating the principles laid down in, in the Nuremberg trials uh, for which the Nazi leaders were put on trial and, and hanged, and that is for uh, aggressive war, or preemptive war. That is war, not in self-defense. Uh, so this, this is a very serious thing. Uh, this declaration of uh, principles in the national security strategy, um, and, uh, and we shouldn't think it was just a, a, a Bush Republican uh, idea. You know it. Very often we, we like to think um, that uh, before Bush, things were okay. Uh, and, uh, and that Bush represents a dramatic departure uh, from whatever we had before. But in fact, uh, preemption is something that, uh, after all, the United States uh, has made war before, and invaded countries before, well, as we did in Southeast Asia, which was certainly not a matter of defending ourselves, you know. Uh, and the United States has done, has made war unilaterally, this is, and this is before Bush, yeah, made war unilaterally, or carried out bombing missions uh, unilaterally. Uh, uh, I mean, sometimes creating a kind of cloak of, uh, of internationalism by bringing in NATO or some, or by bringing in the UN, uh, as as in Korea, but basically an American uh, enterprise. Uh, and in fact, uh, under Clinton, Madeleine Albright said at one point, some of you may remember this. She said, "You know, we will, uh, if po if uh, possible, we will act in the world multilaterally." But if necessary, we will act unilaterally. Uh, so, yeah, um, and uh, you know, Clinton was uh, not, you know, averse to acting uh, unilaterally and preemptively. Uh, and uh, what happens in the present situation is that. Uh, I must say this, that very often liberals in the United States, people who are not for Bush, uh, yes, liberals uh, in the United States, uh, accept with sort of qualifications here and there, but accept basically the, the, the Bush principles. And the, the reason for this, I think, is that 9-11 uh, had a very powerful psychological effect on, 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 on everybody in America. Uh, but I think there are many people in the United States, liberal intellectuals, who are really, I think, so affected emotionally by what happened on 9-11 that uh, I think it began to distort their thinking. I know they wouldn't like me saying this, uh, 
distort their thinking about what was happening in the world and about America's role in the world. And, and they, were, they were sort of becoming hysterical uh, over terrorism. And again, yes, there's a reality of terrorism, but there's a difference between de dealing with terrorism in a, an intelligent and, and real way and becoming hysterical over terrorism in the way that l actually liberals in the 1950s, and those of you who know some of the history of, of, in, of the United States in the 1950s during the Cold War period, during what is called the McCarthy period, uh, you might remember that there were uh, not just McCarthy people, but liberal people, uh, Democrats, uh, who uh, reacted hysterically to, to what they considered the communist threat. I mean, to the point where Hubert Humphrey, who was a sort of a quintessential American uh, political liberal, uh, Hubert Humphrey suggested uh, the notion of uh, internment camps for dangerous people in the United States uh, in times of crisis. Uh, and, uh, and I think we're seeing you know, something of the same phenomenon. Because I was reading in the, in the liberal magazine, the American Prospect, with the editors in their recent issue, they, uh, you know, they, they, their premise is that the greatest immediate threat to our lives and liberties are Islamic terrorists with global reach. Well. And therefore, when facing a substantial, immediate, and provable threat, the United States has both the right and the obligation to strike preemptively, and if need be, unilaterally, against terrorists or states that support them. Uh, preemptively, and if need be, unilaterally. Well, that is the Bush doctrine. And of course, uh, they qualify this by saying, facing a substantial, immediate, and provable threat. The problem is that those who decide whether a threat is, in fact, substantial, immediate, provable, people who decide that will not be the liberal intellectuals who formulated this, but the people who run the government of the United States. They will decide it just as Bush decided it when he decided to go to war in Afghanistan and when he decided to go to war in Iraq. No. And uh, so uh, this idea, these ideas of unilateralism and preemption, and, and uh, these, are, these, are, these are not new. The whole history uh, of uh, the United States in the world is a history of expansion based on these and, and, also, and rationales given like the rationales given today uh, when we go to war about spreading liberty and democracy and, and civilization. Uh, and, you know, we uh, declared war on Mexico in, in 1846 and again for the purpose of uh, sort of teaching civilization to the Mexicans. And then uh, we went into Cuba in 1898 and, uh, to bring liberty to the Cubans. And, uh, and in fact, there's, you know, there's always a uh, or a lot of times, a certain measure of truth to these statements. That is, we did expel Spanish domination from Cuba. We, we liberated the Cubans from Spain, but not from ourselves. Because once Spain was gone, the United States moved in, corporations moved in, the American military moved in, American wrote, rewrote the Cuban Constitution. Uh, but the rationale was, you know, we are bringing freedom to the Cubans. And then, of course, going into the Philippines and, and uh, bringing civilization, as McKinley said. Christianity, he will, we will Christianize and civilize the Filipinos. Uh, and because uh, we, are, we, are, we are different, uh, we are better. There was, uh, at the time of the, of the invasion of the Philippines, the uh, American Secretary of War, Elia Root, said uh, sort of a very uh, classical statement of, of American exceptionalism. He said, the American soldier is different from all other soldiers of all other countries since the world began. He is the advance guard of liberty and justice, of law and order, and of peace and happiness. 
American soldier is different. Well, of course, now, right now, immediately now, in the, in the wake of Abu Ghraib, in the wake of all these revelations coming out every day about torture uh, and uh, uh, atrocities and so on, uh, that uh, doesn't sound right. But you might say, well, Root could not anticipate Abu Ghraib, but he didn't have to anticipate because at the time he was saying this, the United States was already committing atrocities and massacres in the Philippines uh, uh, by these American soldiers who were different from soldiers you know, all over the world. And, uh, and our, our, the history, uh, the history of, of American expansion in the world is not a history which is taught very much uh, in our schools or even in our colleges and universities. That is, it's, it's, uh, um, we have something called diplomatic history. Uh, that's a discipline. Discipline is diplomatic history. And that's what our history is. Very often it's diplomatic history and we diplomatically treat uh, American, uh, you know, foreign policy in the world, uh, because if if young people uh, in our schools learned the history of the United States expansion in the world, if they learned the history of the uh, massacres and invasions that accompanied American expansion in the world. Uh, they could not possibly believe the President of the United States when he gets up uh, before the nation and says we're going into this uh, uh, country to, for liberty uh, and democracy. This is Operation Enduring Freedom and so on. Uh, but that history is not there. And, and this misuse of history is, it continues to be perpetuated uh, by, by our political leaders and not really caught or criticized by that uh, part of the American culture which is supposed to check up on and criticize what the government does, that is the press, uh, the media. And so you, you, you have Bush uh, appearing, as he did a couple of years ago, before the Philippine National Assembly and saying uh, to the Philippine National Assembly, uh, the uh, I don't know. He said, America is proud of its part in the great story of the Filipino people. Together, our soldiers liberated the Philippines from colonial rule. Well, the people in the Philippine National Assembly sitting there, uh, you wonder, it must have taken a lot of self-restraint to just sit there and, and listen to this, liberated the Philippines. 600,000 or so Filipinos died in this long war against the Filipinos. Uh, and at the end of it, when the United States was triumphant, it did not bring liberty to the Philippines. It brought decades and decades and decades of military dictatorship to the Philippines. Uh, uh, but uh, I remember um, there was a point, I don't know, about a year ago where the Mexican ambassador to the UN uh, said something undiplomatic about the United States and Mexico. Uh, he said something about how the United States uh, uh, has been treating Mexico as its backyard. He was immediately reprimanded by Colin Powell, who said that he, this man did not understand the history of U.S.-Mexican relations. Uh, and uh, in fact, he was soon removed from his post. That's how much clout we have. He was soon removed from his post uh, as Mexican ambassador uh, to the United Nations. Uh, so, uh, So yes, with, without that history, you might uh, 
He might actually believe Bush when he uh, says uh, in, in his recent inaugural address that uh, it is, uh, how did he put it, that is uh, the sort of the mission uh, of the United States uh, to spread liberty around the world. As he put it, spreading liberty around the world, as he put it, is the calling of our time. And if you read the newspapers, including the so-called liberal press, the New York Times and the Washington Post, right after the uh, Bush's inaugural address, you saw a flurry of, of uh, praise for what Bush had said. Uh, the people were uh, in the editorial rooms of these newspapers were, were so eager to hear those words about spreading liberty in the world, and as if everything else that has been reported uh, from Iraq over the past two years uh, f is meaningless uh, in the light of these beautiful words uh, uttered by George Bush. Uh, but all I would have to do would be to just, uh, have a, with a very short memory, remember that a couple of days before Bush's inaugural uh, address, uh, a couple of days before that, there was a photo uh, in the New York Times, which some of you may have seen, it was that showed a, uh, an Iraqi girl uh, crouching, bleeding, and according to the caption, she was screaming uh, because her parents uh, had just been shot to death uh, by Americans firing on their car. Uh, and of course, the, you know, there's always, well, we w claim the military, we'll investigate. Oh, we, there were warning shots. How do you distinguish a warning shot from a shot? Uh, but in any case, uh, there's some, to me, this was some uh, remarkable juxtaposition of um, but also a testament to the, to the loss of memory, even uh, a memory that can last a couple of days, uh, to see this uh, uh, eager acceptance of Bush's words ab about uh, liberty. Uh, and uh, this idea of uh, American exceptionalism, uh, You were told I would speak for an hour, so <laughs> I'm taking advantage of every minute of it. You see, <laughs> because when I heard it, I said, "No, I'm not going to speak for an hour." Actually, I'm going to speak for two hours. Uh, but uh, um, what this idea of, of a special American dispensation in the world, what it leads to, is a uh, an abrogation of all sorts of uh, responsibilities to the human race, to everybody else in the world. And it means that the, the United States is exempt from these responsibilities. Uh, when when I, I told you about Mad, Madeleine Albright declaring that we have a right, if necessary, to be unilateral, when she said that, Henry Kissinger said, uh, uh, this principle of our right to take unilateral action, he said, should not be universalized. That's an interesting thought. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good principle <laughs> for us, but to, no, <laughs> it shouldn't be universalized, no. And so there are all this, this, there's a long list of instances in which the United States uh, has declared itself exempt from a sort of international agreements and international laws and uh, the UN Charter and the, you know, the Convention on Biological Weapons, you know, which uh, was actually signed some years ago, but which didn't have any teeth, didn't have any force. And when it was proposed to enforce the, uh, the this Convention on Biological Weapons a few years ago, the Bush administration said, no, no way. Uh, it, it wouldn't go along with that. 
And, and, you know, and I think most of us know the United States has not gone along with the hundred or more nations that have outlawed landmines. And just the other day, I, I spoke to, a, a, listened to actually, a, and spoke with a presentation by a, a surgeon, an Italian surgeon, who for 15 years has been doing surgery on war victims in every possible war zone of the world. Most of the, most of the people he operates on, which includes a lot of amputations, are children. And much of that comes from landmines, a hundred million of which are strewn around the world. But the United States wants to be exempt from the notion that we should outlaw landmines. And of course, we continue, you know, we, uh, things outlawed by, you know, the Geneva Convention and uh, cluster bombs and napalm and, and, uh, and uh, so, uh, Well, so what's the answer? To, what's the answer to to this uh, uh, very dangerous notion of uh, uh, American exceptionalism of our, our right to do as we will in the world? Well, I, no, I guess you know the, the. I guess the answer is sort of obvious, and you know the. the that the answer is that uh, those of us in the United States and in the world who don't accept this idea must uh, declare very forcibly and, and act very vigorously uh, uh, against this idea uh, and insist that the uh, ethical norms uh, that most decent people can agree on uh, uh, should be observed, uh, and and that no country should be an exception uh, to the rules of morality in the world affairs, uh, and that uh, the children of the world should all be seen as part of a family, and that and that uh, the children of Iraq or the children of China or the children. Uh, of anywhere in the world uh, have the same right to life as American children. Uh, I mean, those are very fundamental moral principles which the, if our government doesn't uphold them, we must uphold them. Fortunately, there, there are people all over the world who, who want to uphold those principles and who oppose it when the United States does not. And we saw, you know, on February 15th, uh, 2003, uh, on the eve of the of the invasion of Iraq, we saw that amazing moment when, on one day, 10 to 15 million people around the world, uh, in 60, 70 countries around the world, demonstrated uh, against that war. Uh, and we've uh, so there there are people all over the world who who uh, do not accept the idea of American exceptionalism. Uh, when last week the State Department issued its report on human rights abuses. Some of you may have seen that in the newspapers. The State Department issued its report on, on, it does this every year. It lists countries which are guilty of torture and other abuses of human rights. And, uh, and so it lists yeah, a bunch of countries. A number of those countries are countries which are allies of the United States. A number of those are countries to which the United States has sent prisoners. And you know, I think by now you know that this notion of extraordinary rendition, where we're, uh, we're not going to torture these people, we'll send them to countries which will torture them. And so the State Department issues this list of countries which have violated human rights. And then when the, when the report came out, there were uh, responses from around the world uh, which said, hey, there's one country which is missing from this list. Yes, what about the United States? And what about, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, a, Turkish, a Turkish newspaper said, there's not even a mention of the incidents in Abu Ghraib prison, uh, no mention of Guantanamo. A newspaper in Sydney, Australia, uh, 
pointed out that uh, you know, the United States sends suspects. Remember, suspects are not people who've been tried and found guilty of anything, just people who are suspected of doing something. Send suspects to prisons in Morocco, Egypt, Libya, Uzbekistan, you know, countries that the State Department says uses torture. And uh, so uh, people around the world, yes, and here in the United States. And this is, uh, this is something that we very often are deprived of. We're not only deprived of history, we're very often deprived of immediate history because we're deprived of things that happen in this country that people are doing uh, that uh, we don't know about because this is a big country and because, but that's, that would be an easy excuse that we're a big country and that's why we don't know about them. No, we don't know ab about these things that are happening uh, around the country, these uh, protests, these declarations of humanity. We don't know about them because they're not really reported. Uh, and uh, so you, well, you, you know, you, if you go to the internet, you might find out. Uh, if you go to a rally, you might get some of this information. If you travel around the country, you might learn that, you know, uh, this coming weekend there will be demonstrations in cities all over the country. There's going to be a demonstration in New Orleans. There's going to be a demonstration uh, in Fayetteville, uh, North Carolina. There, uh, and uh, there's a resistance movement in the United States to this war. And you see only the, the uh, superficial, you might say, recognition of this when you read public opinion polls which show that now about half the country uh, does not believe in the war. And if half the country does not believe in the war, then somewhere among that 50%, there must be many, many people who are actively opposing that war. And those people are, are, are in fact, engaged in protest uh, all over the United States. And what's perhaps most significant is that in the armed forces and in the families of the armed forces, uh, there is more and more uh, defection from this war. The uh, Iraqi veterans uh, f against the war formed uh, in kind of uh, reprise of what we had during Vietnam, Vietnam veterans uh, against the war. And we have uh, military families speak out of the families of soldiers uh, uh, organizing and who now have thousands of members. And GIs themselves, GIs in the field, and you read about instances of mutiny, and, uh, and GIs who, who say we, we don't want to, who've been to Iraq, who are being sent back, who don't want to go back. Uh, and some of them go to Canada, and some of them get court-martialed. and. Uh, uh, this is important because I, I think of uh, I think of what Einstein said when at the end of after World War I, horrified by that war and by the idea of war itself and by the knowledge that now modern warfare uh, would be indiscriminate and massive. Uh, and Einstein said, uh, "Wars will stop when men refuse to fight." Uh, uh, and so the, yeah, the refusal to fight and the refusal of families to let their kids fight and the insistence of, of the parents of high school kids that they will not let uh, recruiters come into the high schools and approach their kids, all of these things, uh, uh, these things are uh, consistent with what Einstein thought was ultimately the way that wars would stop. So I leave you with uh, uh, the idea that uh, we're not alone and that there are people all over the world and people in this country who uh, do not accept the idea of a special dispensation to do whatever we want in the world and who will insist on, on uh, uh, human equality of people everywhere. And I'm, uh, I think of uh, William Lloyd Garrison, the uh, abolitionist. I think of what was on the masthead of his, of his anti-slavery newspaper, uh, The Liberator. On his masthead uh, were the words, uh, uh, 
my country is the world. My country men are mankind. Uh, a good thing to remember. Thank you.